Hello, I'm from Excavation Analysis, a team of, uh, in Historic England, a team of archaeologists and archaeological scientists who carry out research for Historic England, sometimes carry out public-facing uh, excavation or survey at English heritage sites. These days are fieldwork projects involving, involving hired archaeological staff are few, two to three a year, and generally quite small, and it can be quite difficult to recruit staff for projects like these. We rely heavily on archaeologists who have worked for us before coming back, and some do for a number of reasons. We often work at night on nice sites such as here, Marble Hill in London. We try, try to provide good accommodation, and I hope we pay relatively well. We're concerned to make sure that colleagues enjoy their time with us and want to come back again. As most employers do, we've always provided health and safety inductions at the start of each piece of fieldwork, covering the site-specific risk assessment, uh, roles and responsibilities, and the reporting procedures for accidents and dangerous occurrences. Also for some years, after problems with bullying in some projects, we've been giving a, help, a bullying and harassment briefing in addition to this. Originally it focused on bullying, but the very act of giving such a briefing stimulated discussion of other inappropriate behaviours. The harassment element of the briefing expanded, especially after the glass, CIFA Glass Ceilings 2015 conference session and the establishment of everyday sexism and the CFA Equality and Diversity Group. We pointed archaeologists working for us towards these sources for examples of the behaviours that archaeologists have suffered from in fieldwork. This has recently been expanded through a paper by Doug Box McQueen, 91 Stories of Archaeology, a harrowing collection of stories of sexual misconduct in academia invo involving archaeologists. At the same time, there's been further discussion on Twitter under the hashtag Times Up Academia, which raised similar issues. Uh, I've, sorry, this is the next. This, uh, we also have the recent um, uh, Badger um, Harassment Guide. The briefing that we provide on site covers English heritage policy, our responsibilities as employers, and reporting procedures, ensuring there are informal communication channels as well as formal ones. The briefing also covers examples of inappropriate behaviour, citing examples from Catherine Clancy et al. 2014 paper, a Safe Project in Everyday Sexism. I will now have more reference material to provide specific examples of bullying harassment that might be helpful. Uh, we can make better use also of Historic England guidance. Above all, we remind our colleagues that they've been employed because of their professional skills and experience, and we will treat them with respect regardless of differences, and we ask them to treat each other in the same way. Feedback from the archaeologists working for us has been positive. Some found the briefing uncomfortable, but it has sparked some helpful and interesting discussions. We need to make the links to Historic England staff guidance clearer and to provide contact details for reporting. There's also a need to build trust. I can't assume that new staff will, staff will necessarily trust me or the project manager, for example. So how do we get around that until we're able to, able to earn that trust? Uh, we usually have sp uh, many specialist staff visiting our excavations, some of whom are prospect union representatives, including Hugh Corley, who is our branch equalities representative. So I encourage staff to raise any concerns with whoever they feel most comfortable speaking to, men or women. I stress in the briefing that once an issue is raised, we have to and will take it seriously. And the briefing also includes the historic thing complaints procedure. More disturbingly, our colleagues often tell us that they haven't heard such a briefing before. We have to treat this with some caution. Our field projects tend to be small, as I said, with low numbers of staff, and they hardly represent a large sample of the UK profession. So, do these briefings matter? Uh, the recent report, um, shown here by Nelson, Rutherford, Hind and Clancy, highlights the importance of setting clear guidance on appropriate professional behaviour and rules on field projects. It, it shows that the experience of people in projects with clear and enforceable rules were markedly better uh, than those where such rules and guidance were absent. It also demonstrates the impact that expedient harassments and assaults can have on career trajectories. This paper clearly shows the benefits of providing clear briefing, guidance and reporting procedures of bullying harassment. We are therefore looking to improve our, uh, our briefings uh, to make them clearer and more effective in the future. I would thus like to, to do this, I would like to share experience with others carrying out such briefings in the UK so we can prepare, compare notes 
of what works well and what doesn't. Lisa Westcott Wilkins of Dig Ventures has recently published their learning agreement for field schools, which includes a strong section on safety and dignity at work and on site. If we are to build a more diverse and representative discipline, we need to do better. The evidence is building that harassment forms one of the factors that drives people out of our profession or prevents them coming in in the first place. We must tackle it head on. Thanks for listening and we're available for questions. Thanks also to the excavation staff who have listened and responded to the briefings and to Jesse Ransley of Southampton University for the help of the session.